uh, once again welcome everyone um, welcome uh, on another very interesting conversation uh, with uh, some of the best uh, minds uh, and the personality in the financial markets uh, the one who are known for their in depth knowledge and vast experience of decades in the field of investments uh, we have mark fabo uh, with us today uh, to share with his Uh, thoughts uh, on what really his take are on this uh, very interesting junction in uh, india's economic uh, journey and we had a very interesting budget and uh, i'll welcome mark uh, he, no introduction required mark uh, editor publisher of uh, gloom boom doom report and uh, very uh, recognized for his contrarian view uh, the way i uh, remember mark and uh, welcome mark uh, on this very uh, special and uh, post budget conversation thank you for having me on your program it's always a pleasure uh, even though i'm not physically in india to be with indian people no no mark you, you've been always been there i, I heard you on number of occasions uh, and, and you know it's always been interesting listening to you uh, you give a complete different perspective to a lot of things the understand and i think your 50 years of experience of investment <laughs> always comes handy uh, please don't tell that to everyone <laughs> makes me look old <laughs> <laughs> no, no i think we both of us look old uh, great uh, thanks thanks once again mark and uh, mark just to start with i i i'm sure you you had an opportunity to you're the finance minister And, and and what's your take uh, mark in terms of the budget well in general i have to say that uh, i have again been confirmed in the view that actually indian economists nowadays understand more about economics than american economists because the finance minister in india clearly sees that uh, capital spending is relevant for the indian economy and that not consumption because consumption has a very limited uh, multiplier impact on the economy whereas capital spending keeps on generating future cash flows and flu- future dividends and so the emphasis of the budget is on capital spending which i think is a very desirable objective great uh, so mark in terms of this particular uh, you know uh, importance to investments i i think the indian policies which have been now been driven by uh, you know pli scheme make in india uh, infrastructure uh, Uh, the, the the recent policy in terms of connectivity do you believe that this particular policy framework can take us into a very sustainable higher growth trajectory over a period of time well i don't think that india needs a higher growth trajectory because in the indian economy if you compare it to say moribund europe or the us is actually a rapidly growing economy already so i think the question should be uh, can we maintain economic growth that we have experienced over the last 10 15 years at a high level without causing bubbles and uh, excesses and i think the policy of the minister of finance in india is uh, geared towards essentially uh, steady growth at the high rate in my opinion the projected rate for this year of growth is around 9% or over 9% i think that's an incredibly high and ambitious gro- rate of growth and i think it, the the indian economy the problem is not the rate of growth it is that the stock market is actually highly valued already now i do not deny that lots of companies have been in a bear market for a long time 
and are just emerging out of a major low and have a great uh, future prospects. I think the banking sector would be an example where the, the outlook is favorable in the long run. Yeah, so great, uh, Mark. So you picked up the sector. So, so in, in your opinion, what are the you know, five sectors will, which will benefit from this budget and where, where do you see pain? At least maybe a few sectors which you can think of. Well, as I said, I think the financial sector is attractive. I think that the improvement in infrastructure spending will lead to a more decentralized economy in the sense that in the past, transportation was a problem in India. And with the emphasis on capital spending and connectivity, I think there will be many more centers of industries and commerce and innovation that will come up. And so I still think that in real estate, there is plenty of opportunity. And I also believe that uh, worldwide, one stock sector, which has been in a bear market for many years, is telecommunication. Uh, the mobile uh, service providers. And uh, we've seen now in Europe, some of the large private equity firms and hedge funds have been taken, uh, have taken positions in mobile uh, firms, in mobile companies. And I think this is a, a sector like Vodafone India yeah, in, in India, it's called Vodafone Ideas. I think as a bright future, and these are very depressed companies, the stock. So I, I look at these type of sectors. I think the overall market, if you ask me about the indices, the indices worldwide, including the S&P and the NASDAQ and so forth, have been driven by very few stocks. And in my opinion, they're fully valued. And we are, as you pointed out in your introduction, at a very interesting juncture in markets because uh, liquidity is going to tighten somewhat. There's still plenty of liquidity, but it's not as uh, widely flowing into the system as following the COVID outbreak when they really printed money like there is no tomorrow that they can't do anymore because we have high inflationary pressures in Europe and in the US. The Fed and the ECB are way behind the curves in uh, adjusting interest rates to the level of inflation. They've never been like this, that interest rates are near zero or, or at zero in Europe and inflation is at 6%. So the negative rate of interest, uh, the real rate of interest is minus 6%, never been before, not even in the inflationary 70s. So I, I'm suggesting that stock markets are actually in many cases fully priced, the fung and fung related stocks. But as we have seen in the last 10 years, active managers have underperformed the indices I think now active managers have an opportunity in selecting sectors and selecting individual companies. And in India, say you have 5,000 different companies that you can invest in. Uh, out of those, uh, probably a third, 30% or 20% that haven't performed well. And there I see an opportunity. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Mark. And, and any sector on which you are negative now because the global my, macro, uh, you know, headwind in terms of, uh, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the rising interest rate scenario, fighting inflations. So is there anything which you really say no, 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 no area or no go to area? Well, in the US, I can just tell you, but we have to see very clearly Markets, the Indian economy is not that correlated to other economies in the world because 
foreign trade as a percent of the economy is not as high as say in China or in Singapore and so forth, but the financial market is linked to foreign markets in the sense that if a sector gets sold off in the US like software or cloud computing or uh, communication, telecommunication and so forth, if that gets sold in America, it's sold in Japan and in other countries as well. So financial markets are closely linked to each other. And I can say that in the US last year, the S&P was up strongly, over 20%. But an innovation fund like uh, ARC, uh, Cathie Woods ARC Innovation, mm. from the peak in January 2021 to now, it's down 50%. Yeah. So, so you, you understand there are many stocks is like in the mining industry, in the new issue industry, whatever you have when there is new industries, 90% fail. And one is a big winner. At the beginning of the automobile industry in America, they had 290 different car manufacturers. There are now basically two left, GM and Ford. So there's a shrinkage. And for each Facebook and Google and Apple that you have, which are success stories, you have massive failures, massive number of companies that won't make it. And I think the same will happen with all the new issues and all the new technologies that we have globally, including India. So once again, I'm emphasizing to ask me, Will the market go up or down? I think the indices will perform uh, disappointingly. But within the whole market, uh, there are opportunities to make money. It's like if you look at the world, a depressed market is Argentina. A depressed market is Brazil. Russia is depressed. Russia is unbelievably cheap because of the foreign political problems they have with Ukraine, which is really not the fault of Mr. Putin. I'd like to point this out. Only Americans will tell you that, oh, it's all the fault of Putin. <laughs> They've been saying that for everything that went wrong, it's the fault of China or it's the fault of Putin. They never take their own blame. <laughs> India is very lucky, it's in a sweet spot. They never blame India for anything. <laughs> no, no. Fortunately, we are friendly for both sides. We are we are aligned to both. So we really don't get into that. Path. Yes, that's that's a very good idea, and I hope that India has the wisdom that it will not get involved in a provocation by imperialistic thinking nations. Uh, it's true, Fab. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, Mark. Uh, another important. I think you rightly highlighted the pain of the new age economy, and I think India is now the one where you are seeing the you know birth of you know number of you know unicorns. Right? We never had so many companies really coming to the forefront, and now they are entering the public market from the private market to public market. So, whether it is Zomato, Nike, uh, Policy Bazaar. Now there's so many companies uh, and the Baijus of the world which will come. What is there anything specific you want to, uh, or, or are you tracking any of these companies or sectors which, uh, do you think that India can be a potentially have a larger number of winner compared to say US or you believe that they broadly fall into the same category, what you just recently explained? Well, you know, I'm not, uh profit and uh, I, I wouldn't know whether the percentage of companies that succeed in uh, India will be larger than in the US. But it is conceivable that in a, or likely that in an economy that grows, say, trend line grows, if you at your size of a country, if you can grow per annum by five to 8%, it's very high growth. I'd like to point this out. 
People always dream that their portfolios will appreciate by 10 to 20% per annum. This is a fallacy. This is an illusion. If you can uh, grow your money, I'm talking about your total assets by 5% per annum, you die a very rich man, provided you inherited some money from your parents and you don't have to start at zero. But I'm just saying, uh, we have to be realistic. And we had uh, booming financial markets since 2009 because of money printing. But as I pointed out, this money printing will slow down. It may not slow down in the quantity, but it will slow down as a percent of the economy, as a percentage of the economy and of the total money supply. You know, in the US, we just reached today $30 trillion in debt, government debt. Yep. We yep. have to, as an economist, you should adjust your gross rate by the amount of additional debt you incurred. And then the gross rates in America look very bad. Right. Uh, I, I think I think that that's that's an entire uh, you know uh, mark how really ultimately will diffuse this you know massive debt right um, uh, you, you almost printed so much money uh, Fed expanded balance sheet and today we are talking about you know finally uh, that you will stop buying any more bonds and maybe mostly we will start tapering at least the balance sheet. Uh, in that context, Mark, uh, you know, how do you see global allocation uh, and asset allocation, right? Uh, emerging market, and, and you're a contrarian, right? I, I, really, <laughs> I really look forward that what I'm going to hear from Mark this time, which is going to be completely different and out of the box. But, but from current context, I think, Mark, uh, inflation uh, uh, coming out from a very low interest rate to normalization of the rate, and the fact that sitting on a massive debt globally, uh, where do you believe the right allocation should be? You are an optimist when you say normalization of interest rates. That's normalization of interest rates in the US would mean that today uh, the Fed fund rate would have to be around seven, eight percent. And they're debating whether they will increase the Fed fund rate by, you know, 1% this year in four increases or five increases. In my view, they are, I mean, the economist Stephen Roach, he used to be chief economist at uh, Morgan Stanley, he's a friend of mine, he's a professor at Yale now. He says, they're so far behind the curve, they can't even see the curve anymore, the Fed members. And Lagarde, who has always maintained that inflation is transitory, she saw way behind. They, it, the whole system collapses if the Fed fund rate goes in a short period of time to 2%, I'm telling you. Because the government debts are so large, it's a horror scenario. But then as an investor, you ask yourself, as you said, how do I allocate my assets? And I'm a believer that actually, and I've always said it uh, in recent years, the Indian central bank, is a very responsible central bank. The currency has been stable and they recognize the problem that is caused by asset bubbles. And so they're very prudent compared to the Federal Reserve and the ECB that essentially print money irresponsibly, irresponsibly. Last year, housing prices in the US, not that they were cheap before because you have real estate taxes, they were up 19%. You think that home prices go up 19% every year? 
and what the Fed has done, and now they talk about it, but they never take the blame. By printing money like they did, they made wealthy people very wealthy. And they hurt the lower middle class and uh, salary recipients whose wages are going up less than the rate of inflation. I mean, I'm an economist, but I also I'm, have assets. As far as at the asset holder, I'm always saying print, 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 because my stock portfolio goes up and uh, my real estate goes up and so forth. But as an economist and as a social observer, I tell you, these policies are a recipe for disaster. And as an investor, I advise everyone to invest much more money in emerging economies. The future is not in Europe and in the United States. The future is in emerging economies. Whether it is India, or Russia, or China, or Brazil, or Argentina, or some African countries, who knows? But the future is where the socialists are not in charge. India had socialism for long enough. They will, don't, want, don't want to go back. Modi is the best prime minister India has had post uh, essentially independence. He's a reformer and he's a pragmatist. If we were under the Gandhi family still, we'd be 20 years behind of what we are today. Right. Uh, true. So, so Mark, if for me, normalization of interest rate is at best 2%. Beyond that, even <laughs> if you tell me to go and look at the curve of 4, 5, 7% in US, I, I think I will just shut down and close all the portfolios. So Yeah, yeah, sure. But... Uh, Let's say we go to 2%, interest rates will still be negative in real terms. Yeah. You know, so you get 2%, but the cost of living is going up by 6%. And who knows, it may actually accelerate on the upside because one sector we didn't talk about is the whole commodities complex. Yeah. I don't think that commodity prices will go down a lot. Because just looking at the cost of uh, producing copper nowadays and finding new mines and uh, producing gold and silver and platinum and all this. And if you have a conflict in uh, Ukraine, then energy costs could go up substantially. So I think uh, the rate of inflation, if anything, it will not decline much. It may not accelerate on the upside, but the price level in the Western world <coughs> has increased substantially. Much more than what the government is showing you. You ask people, what is your cost of living compared to, say, 20 years ago, and they will tell you. Anyway. That won't come back a lot. So my sense is you have to be also in assets that cannot be multiplied indefinitely. My, hence my preference for real estate. Two, uh, I think people should own or investors should own some uh, physical precious metals, gold, silver, platinum. I think platinum looks the best but the others are also attractive. And finally, I mean, in India, we have a system of subsidies for agriculture and so forth, which is actually not favorable. But I think there's still a lot of potential in large scale agriculture in India. And uh, people want to eat better. They want to eat more as they have more money. And uh, I think that food will become a big, big issue in future. Food and water. Food, water, real estate. 
and precious metal. That's where. So all the real assets. Well, as you know, the real estate in cyberspace that goes for very high prices. Mm. I can see that it has some advertising value. I can see that. But uh, I, in uh, my state of mind, I like physical real estate. Uh, I think when I look back at the last two years of COVID and our friends, they live in Hong Kong in small apartments. Now all the restaurants close at six o'clock in the evening. They can't go out. They're afraid to go out because if they are in a place where someone has COVID, even if they test negative, they're sent to a, like a prison camp with no TV in the room, cannot smoke, cannot drink, <laughs> cannot do anything. So it's a very harsh way to treat people. Mm. Whereas if you have a house in the countryside, and nowadays you can have a house in the countryside because everything is connected uh, through the connected economy. You don't need to be in Mumbai to carry out the brokerage operation or to manage money or to be an insurance salesman. You can be anywhere in India. And so there's no need to be stuck in the traffic in Mumbai and in Delhi. You can be in the countryside somewhere where you can buy a house, a big house, for less money than a small pad in the city. Absolutely true, absolutely true. I think a lot of so guys... I think that the whole economy will change a lot. I think city centers will become less important and uh, the smaller cities offer huge uh, opportunities. Thanks, thanks, Mark. And Mark, as a last question, I think still I'm 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 hunting for my uh, my answer. Is that how do you how how should we allocate money? I I, I heard in a broad context, uh, will you will you buy emerging? Uh, how what say a typical uh, you know a, a a model portfolio? What will be your allocation broadly uh, in the commodities, in the real estate, and this just to give our you know clients and the investors a thought, uh, what will be a summary? Yes. In my allocation, uh, given that we don't know what governments will do next, and I'm talking here especially about the Western world, because this whole uh, pandemic was a scam and very undesirable and has hurt many people and has also shown the government you can govern with fear. People were fearful. In Thailand, everybody drives motorcycles without a helmet, but with a mask. I mean, you have to ask, you, I can show you the statistics, there are more people who die in traffic accidents than from COVID. <laughs> they don't wear masks. Uh, they don't wear helmets, but masks. Mask. And talk on a mobile phone, on the motorcycle <laughs> as well. So anyway, but uh, where, how to invest? I think in absence of knowing clearly what comes next, I would hold some cash. I also hold some bonds. They're not attractive, but who knows? We've seen in this just recent decline in January, they didn't perform so badly. And I have very little in the US. I don't like the US dollar. I don't like the US government. Although I admit that uh, after Reagan, I didn't like any of the American presidents. So it's, I'm consistent <laughs> in my view. And, uh, but this president and his administration are a complete disaster but really a complete disaster. But I hold equities in emerging economies, mostly in Asia. And I own precious metals, approximately 25% of my portfolio is in physical gold, silver, and platinum. And I hold some European stocks because some European companies 
relative to the US are depressed. And this year I will start to buy more in Latin America. And Russia has already been part of your portfolio, Mark. I've been getting yes, personal, yes. But... I, I bought recently. Normally, I don't invest through ETFs, but in Russia, I bought an ETF, and I will buy more Russian securities. I think the Russian economy, surprisingly, is actually very well financed. They don't have a large government debt, and Putin has been a good leader compared to all the other leaders we have, whereby good compared to European and American leaders is not a difficult thing to be. But in, I, I'm telling you as a foreign investor and as an observer of the globe, I think Modi has done a very good job, very good job. Under difficult conditions, as you know, India is not a very homogeneous country and yes. not so easy to govern. Yeah, yeah. We are, we are massive demography. We are number of people. Yeah. Just resources. look at your family. <laughs> yeah. Look after your families. Yes, yes. I, I think we are we are large economy. Uh, comparably, our per capita income is much, much smaller, whereas we have a very constrained resources. So energy is a constraint for us. Uh, land is a constraint for us. But yeah, I think in all those constraints and the fact is that we run a very large democratic, uh, you know, democratic country compared to any other place. It's very difficult job broadly to run such a large economy. Yes, but I think the biggest constraint for India, if I may say, is actually that Indians don't believe in their own culture. Because if you look at history and most Europeans and Americans They've dealt with Indian history in one hour. <laughs> they dealt with their own history in maybe thousands of hours. But Indian history and culture and civilization is not known in the Western world. And if you look at how the world was at the time Jesus Christ was born 2000 years ago, a thousand years ago, three thousand years ago, India was one of the most advanced societies in the world. And if you look at GDP in India and in China and in the rest of the world, say 500 years ago, 300 years ago, there were 60% of the global economy. And that's why I say India needs its own confidence in its own way of life and also in its potential to be a dynamic society. It's true, true, absolutely true. Thank you, thank you, Mark. And I think it was amazing discussion and amazing interaction. And I'm sure uh, all of us will really love to hear again from you. And I think it's always been interesting to have you on our channel. So great. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for having me. <laughs> thank you. Look forward to see you again. Investments in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all related documents carefully before investing. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon to never miss an update from ICICI Direct.